guys. I'm glad you're here. I am also here. And yes, if you are here, please absolutely make sure that you say good morning or hi or I'm here or really anything you like. <laughs> hi, Anonymous Penguin, also known as Sheila. Um, okay, that's great. So yes, add yourselves in. And um, I would also um, like to tell you a little story about, um, well, two things actually. One is that I got to meet Chloe yesterday um, because we were both in the nature preserve at the same time. So that was really a wonderful treat, Chloe. I'm, I'm so glad that um, we got to meet mask to mask, so to speak. Um, I had issued an invitation to my much smaller class, which is called A Walk Into Nature, to um, go for a little walk at the nature preserve, thinking that only one or two students at most would be able to show up, um, would not have a busy schedule, or would even see the email, or would feel like doing it. And uh, sure enough, two of the students met me there. And when we were on that lovely um, bridge, that's when um, Chloe was there too. And so that was really wonderful. You know, um, driving home from that walk uh, late yesterday afternoon, I found myself feeling very emotional, um, which I have managed not to be all semester long. My friends who are teachers would be telling me uh, how upset they were that they couldn't teach their students face to face. And um, though I'm not usually very Pollyanna-ish, I kept saying, you know, oh, but there are advantages too, and listing all the advantages. And then it just hit me like a wave on uh, my drive home, just how much I miss seeing you guys, really seeing you in person and being able to, you know, just to be in the presence of you guys makes a huge difference to see a student, really see them, you know, standing there and gestures and expressions. There's a whole world of connection that gets lost. So I know we're doing our best here, but um, I also know that it's, it's hard, it's really hard. And um, good morning, Lexis and Alexandra and Adam. I, uh, I wanted to um, also show you something kind of wonderful that um, happened this morning. And that is, well, it was almost pretty terrible actually, but my, um, I heard my dog barking. I had let her out in the morning and you've seen her. She's just this tiny little Shih Tzu. Um, and when I looked outside, I saw why she was barking. And it was because, I hope you can see this. It was because there was a deer uh, standing right in the middle of our backyard. <laughs> And this tiny little dog was barking and barking at this fairly big doe, um, which was pretty scary. So the first thing I did was call Sophie inside. And for once in her life, she actually listened to me and came inside. Um, but then I realized there wasn't just one deer out there. There were two of them. And I've always um, been told if you see one deer, there's always another behind it. Thanks, Chloe, by the way. And so sure enough, um, my yard is fenced. And I want you to understand, I live in suburban Binghamton, right? I live on the west side. We do not see deer over here. So that was kind of a, a surprise to begin with. And then, and then I realized the reason that they kept standing there was because they didn't know how to get out. So kind of pointed out where the lowest part of the fence was in the yard. And the mama deer went over with no problem, but the baby was hesitating. So I, I wanna show you the video that I took 
um, and hopefully you'll be able to see the fawn going over our fence. So here we go. Oh, I'm so bad at this, but I'm going to try. Okay. Here we go. And she's going to be right around here. So look under this yellow trail. Bring it in as close as I can. Did you see that? Isn't that cool? Adam, do you live um, on the west side too or are you somewhere else? Okay, let's try it one more time and then we'll stop talking about deer. You're so graceful. You're kind of amazing. Okay. Anyway, just wanted to share that experience with you because living on the west side is beautiful and wonderful in many ways, but um, we don't get a whole lot of deer around here. So, um, wow, a mama bear, you say. Yes, one, one does see a lot of deer on campus and near campus um, and around Vestal. I mean, even in the sort of more suburban looking parts of Vestal, I've heard many stories of there being deer around, but uh, not so much in Bampton. Now, I will not be as delighted if I see bear outside my window. I used to do that when I lived in Susquehanna. All right. So there's still one more thing I want to talk about, actually, before I get to the French symbolists today. And that is kind of connected to what I was saying about how much I miss um, getting to actually see you guys. Um, I've been sort of corresponding with quite a few of you lately, and I keep hearing about how um, hard this semester has been and how many of you are struggling and how many of you are starting to really feel the um, just I guess the cumulative stress of living in these sort of little boxes um, instead of being part of the world you're used to and I've been thinking about that and also thinking about um, how you're spending your time and how many of you are so driven by grades and tests and those kinds of goals. And as you know, all semester long, I've been trying to talk about how really relatively unimportant those things are, certainly not important enough to drive you crazy or um, drive you to behave badly or make you feel sad or depressed or anxious. So um, I know I said that if you took a walk yesterday or today, I would give you extra credit and I still will um, because I honestly believe if you take just, you know, half an hour from your day to walk in the sunlight and allow yourself to think your own thoughts that may have a larger effect on you in the long run than whatever test or paper you're worrying about, which I promise you, you will not remember 20 years from now, but you might, you might see or think something on that walk that you'll still be thinking about 20 years from now. So try to keep things in perspective, I suppose, is what I'm really saying. The things that look like such enormous mountains now may later on just look like paths. And that's really what they are. They're just going to be leading you to wherever you eventually get. And it's not going to hinge on one test or one class, um, but on who you evolve into, who you turn out to be in your own character. Um, so, so I wanted to say that, and I also wanted to say that, you know, next week we're going to be reading um, Poets from the Harlem Renaissance, and um, so 
starting um, the week after that, we will be reading mostly contemporary, certainly more modern feeling um, poets. And so I'm gonna be offering you some creative um, alternatives to your reading journals um, in the future, in the near future. And I'm hoping that that might not only take a little pressure off you, but give you something just kind of fun and joyful and art focused to be doing uh, at the end of the semester instead of feeling like it's kind of hurdle, 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 you know, like one jump after another. So um, we'll be talking about that in the near future and I hope it will be um, a nice break for you. I bet you will throw yourselves into it. Um, okay, anyway, now onto the French symbolists. You know, before I give my lectures, I, I always read whatever I can about the poets, about their biographies, and I also try to find interesting talks or lectures that have been given on these poets. And I tried again uh, last week and this week to find some lectures on poets like Rimbaud and Baudelaire, uh, Verlaine, and so on. And I have to tell you, there's very little out there. And what I did find was not very good. Um, so I told myself to feel encouraged by that because I thought, well, I can't do a whole lot worse than what's already out there. I may as well give it my best shot. I'm gonna tell you from the outset that the French symbolists are not easy to understand, nor did they want to be easy to understand. I know I said at the beginning of the semester that most poets are not out there to confuse you. Um, and most poets are not, that's not their goal. However, in some ways that is the goal of the French symbolists. They want you to be off balance. They don't want you to feel as though you understand them simply or understand anything simply. Um, in the case of Rambeau, he was all about disorientation and um, trying to derange all the senses. Um, that was his project. So one of the reasons that I teach the French symbolists, despite that, despite that sort of seeming difficulty at the at the starting gate is because I think it's important to have that experience sometimes and not run away from it in terror. Um, we're trained to understand everything that's put in front of us and that's not always the case. We can't always do it. And some things are just mysterious or mystifying and sometimes we have to let it rest there and other times we find our way somehow through the mystery the other reason is because the last time I taught this class, the French symbolists were far and away the favorites of my students, which I have to admit surprised me. I don't think I could honestly say they are my favorite poets, but that's really okay because if you guys end up loving them too, then I've done a good thing. I've shown you some poetry that you can relate to and um, that you enjoy. So one of the things you know, now we're looking at poets living in the late uh, 19th century, right? And it's in some ways a movement against romanticism and against classicism and pretty much everything that's come before. One of the things I would imagine you'll notice is that this is not a poetry that finds its um, comfort in order or in God or even in nature, the way, you know, Wordsworth and Coleridge and Keats did, for instance. Um, but instead, to sort of find the truth in the real psychology of human beings. And when I say the real psychology, what I mean is, and, and I do think maybe the French were the very first to be doing this in their literature. Um, to be looking for ways to capture um, how the mind really works, how we actually think, how do we really feel about things, 
what is this chaos between our ears? You know, what does that sound and feel like? And to try somehow to write a poetry that captures some of the truth of that, the kind of gritty truth of it, sometimes the unpleasant truth of what we think or feel, and sometimes just the chaotic quality, I suppose. Um, it's like trying to, I don't know, trying to paint a cloud. You know, it's constantly shifting and moving. It's You can't really, can't get your hands around it, right? Literally, you can't grab onto a cloud and you can't, quite grab onto the human mind either. So here's a quote from German philosopher Heinrich Hein. In artistic matters, he wrote, I am a supernaturalist. I believe that the artist cannot find all his forms in nature, but that the most remarkable are revealed to him in his soul. So if you believe that the most remarkable truths are found in your own soul or your own self, you know, some people would call that solipsism, right? That's the view of the world that it revolves around you, you know, uh, sort of taking I think, therefore I am to even a deeper level um, where you're really just kind of the only thing you can count on. The only thing that feels like truth is whatever you find inside yourself. In some ways, I think it's a very dangerous way to um, think but it's also a kind of um, understandable way to feel and think because after all, that's what we're living with most of the time, right? Uh, is the sort of echo of our own thoughts and uh, reverberations of our own emotions. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about Baudelaire, Charles Baudelaire. I, again, I have to tell you that most of the students last year really loved Rambo, the sort of bad boy of poetry um, and kind of cause celeb. He was, uh, I would say, notorious rather than famous in his day. Um, Baudelaire was the first translator of Edgar Allan Poe um, in, into French, obviously. Um, and I'll get to maybe why he would have been drawn to Poe a bit later. His father died um, when Baudelaire was still very young and his mother, who was much younger than his father had been and whom Baudelaire adored, remarried a military man uh, who was quite a strict stepfather to Baudelaire. Um, and Baudelaire was sort of shipped off to private schools this is a story that in some ways, I'm sure you understand parallels the biography of Issa, right? Whose mother died and so um, he was shipped out of the house to become an apprentice. And at private school, he was noted for um, his brilliance, his depressions, his solitariness, um, and what the teachers called precocious depravity. Um, Unsurprisingly, he was expelled in 1839. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned, but he lived between 1821 and 1867. Um, none of these poets lived a very long life. Uh, they lived kind of hard and they lived um, on the edge of things. So he was expelled from this school and then he went on, he studied a law, which of course was something his mother was happy about. Um, but then he later rejected the law and decided that he wanted to devote his life to literature, which um, she was not so crazy about. And needless to say, the stepfather was really not crazy about that. So he finally came into his inheritance from his late father at the age of 21 and he blew the whole thing on you know gambling drinking drugs women um very quickly he had um a series of long unhappy love affairs um with people who tended to kind of use him for his money um and then go on to other things uh some of these affairs included a prostitute who later apparently gave him syphilis, uh, which people think 
is what eventually killed him when he was in his 40s. He was heavily in debt. So his um, mother and father took charge of, mother and stepfather obviously, took charge of his finances. Uh, he did not have control over his own money, which might remind you of the story of Keats, of course. Um, so he became a poet and an art critic and a novelist, as well as a political radical. He was involved in the overthrow of uh, King Louis Philippe um, during the sort of in the establishment of the Second Empire with Napoleon and his gang. His first book of poems was Flowers of Evil, Fleur de Mal. Um, and there were poems that were censored right out of the book. Uh, they were later published separately. His poetry was banned for, here's another quote, obscenity, depravity, and morbidity. And it was 1949 before that ban against Baudelaire was officially lifted in France. Um, it was reviewed in a well-known um, publication called Le Figaro. And uh, the critic wrote, everything in it which is not hideous is incomprehensible. Everything one understands is putrid. So it's like the opposite of Longfellow who was universally adored and um, you know, sort of touted and accepted or for that matter, Blake who was kind of universally ignored um, but instead he was kind of universally despised except for really small group of like-minded artists and poets such as Rambeau, Mallarmé and so on. Um, so impoverished and uh, trying desperately to be accepted into the French Academy, which was never going to happen. It was um, the most conservative group of conservative um, judges of art that you can imagine, showing symptoms of insanity uh, because of the syphilis. Um, he suffered a stroke and um, actually lost his speech for a time and his mother would take him out on carriage rides. Um, and he ended up uh, dying in a nursing home at the age of 46. To me, somehow though, that image of the stricken Baudelaire being driven around the parks by um, his mother in their carriages may be um, the most um, touching and strange thing of all in terms of his life. He, um, I, I believe it's Baudelaire, might be Rambeau. Um, I'll double check in my notes. One of them started as a devout Catholic and ended as a devout Catholic, um, which reminds me a bit of the kind of radicals I knew during the late 1960s who were so against um, corporations and business, and they all seemed to go into uh, big business later in their lives and become quite wealthy. It's just a strange thing about how lives sometimes go around in a circle. But one of the things that Baudelaire was about, and I truly think his poetry is amazingly beautiful and um, kind of surprising and dreamlike and lush. Um, the elevation of, of art and the idea of beauty for its own sake. You know, we have the speaker in the Ode to a Grecian Urn by Keats saying, truth is beauty, beauty, truth, that is all you know and all you need to know on earth, but it's not clear if that is a voice we're supposed to be listening to. By the time we get to Baudelaire, there isn't any doubt that is the voice he thinks we should be listening to. And it also helps explain why he was the first translator of Poe, because that is something that Poe also believed in, art for art's sake. Um, and of course, they were both very interested in human psychology. A lot of Poe's sort of horror stories really appear to be taking 
place for the most part inside of one human being's sort of deranged brain. It's very hard to tell in Poe if we're actually inside someone's head or if we're living outside in a world of kind of horrible reality or is this person sort of trapped inside their own madness. So there's that common theme between them, the idea of creating art for its own sake and kind of dedicating everything to beauty and to what is the truth inside. Um, here's a quote from Baudelaire. He wrote this um, in a letter to his mother after Flowers of Evil was published and had already been widely attacked. He wrote, you know that I've always considered that literature and the arts pursue an aim independent of morality. Beauty of conception and style is enough for me. But this book, whose title, Fleur de Mal, you know, Flowers of Evil, says everything is clad, as you will see, in a cold and sinister beauty. It was created with rage and patience. Besides, the proof of its positive worth is in all the ill they speak of it. The book enrages people. So you get to poets like Baudelaire and Mallarmé and Rimbaud, and they want to enrage people. And that, by the way, is why I um, put those videos from uh, the group, The Doors, into your content material for this week, because I was trying to think of anything comparable in what might be considered sort of modern or contemporary life that would be in some way equivalent to the kind of effect that these poets had on the general public. You know, this sense of um, fascination and horror, the response of censorship. Um, there, there was a song, um, Light My Fire, which is probably The Doors' most famous song. And they were going to sing it on, of all things, The Ed Sullivan Show, but they had been informed beforehand that they had to change the lyrics. Um, I think the lyrics, well, I know the original lyrics were, girl, we couldn't get much higher. And I think they wanted them to change it to something like a uh, girl we couldn't get much nearer or uh, we couldn't get much closer. I forget what it was, but, um, and of course the, the door said, okay. And then they went and performed the song and they sang it just the way they wanted to with the original words. And as they were leaving the stage, um, Ed Sullivan was shouting at them, you know, you'll never be on this show again. And Jim Morrison smiled at him as if to say, we don't really care. We just got to sing our song and we sang it the way we wanted to. So one of the things um, that I linked in the YouTube video of The Doors is it's kind of like a pastiche of what the concerts looked like. There was always a strong police presence around. Um, sometimes they were dragging the fans away. Sometimes they were hauling Jim Morrison away. And he is part of what they call the 27 Club, which is this unfortunately large group of musicians who all died at the age of 27. Janis Joplin is in that group and so on. Um, but I, I wanted to give you this sense of kind of almost violence and, and chaos and um, just breaking the boundaries of what was normally considered acceptable behavior to give you a sense of what effect these poets had in their day. Um, plus, I thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about um, along with what Daisy's going to be talking about, especially the We Real Pool poem. And I posted the poems that Daisy's going to be talking to us about under uh, content material as well. So I hope you'll read that before Thursday, because that's what we talk about. Um, and here is something else that both there wrote. Um, and this is his preface to um, 
Paris Spleen, which are prose poems. So what you were reading by Baudelaire is prose poetry. And if you've never encountered prose poetry, I think he gives a really great description of what it is or what he wanted it to be in um, this sort of preface uh, that he wrote to Paris Spleen, a collection of prose poems. So they're poems, but they're written in blocks of prose. Um, and the book was only published posthumously. Which of us has not dreamed of the miracle, he wrote, of a poetic prose musical without rhythm and without rhyme, supple enough and rugged enough to adapt itself to the poetic impulses of the soul, the undulating leaps of our inner thoughts, the prickings of conscience, and consciousness. It was, above all, out of my exploration of huge cities, out of the medley of countless interrelationships, that this haunting ambition was born. So it is, without a doubt, a poetry of cities, right? I mean, his poetry takes place in cities. And um, so I'm going to I'm going to read you the two prose poems that I chose for this week. I do love both of them. And uh, the first one is from a prose poem called Widows, which appears again in this posthumously published book, uh, Paris Queen. I'll take a sip of my peppermint tea first. By the way, if I, if I seem considerably happier than I was last Thursday, I am. For I think obvious, obvious reasons, right? It has to do with the election and the election results. You know, I was walking around my neighborhood, I guess last Saturday, and I thought this feels like the first time I have actually taken a deep, full breath in four years. I can never keep from throwing a glance, if not sympathetic, at least curious, over the mob of outcasts who press around the enclosure of a public concert. So you notice that these poets don't even try to make themselves likable. In fact, in many cases, they openly make themselves kind of hateful or unsympathetic. From the orchestra across the night float songs of celebration, triumph, pleasure. The dresses of the women shimmer and sway, glances pass. The well-to-do, exhausted with doing nothing, stroll about and pretend to listen to the music. Here are only the rich, the happy. Here is nothing that does not breathe in or out pleasure of being alive, except the empty-headed crowd that presses against the outer gate, catching for free at the will of the wind, a tatter of music, and watching the splendor glittering within. The way the eyes of the poor reflect the wealthy's pleasure is always curious. But this day, in sharp contrast to the workers dressed in uniforms and cotton, I saw one whose nobility stood out against the crowd. She was tall and majestic, her whole bearing possessed a noble calm I've never seen, not even the, in the aristocratic beauties of the past. The perfume of virtue emanated from her whole being. Her face, sad and worn, was in keeping with the heavy mourning she wore. No, it's like black she is in mourning. She too, like the mob she mingled with but did not see, gazed at that glittering world with a thoughtful eye nodding in time to the music. Strange sight. Surely, I thought, this poverty, if it is poverty, could not be capable of sordid economy, 
Her noble face is proof of that. Why does she stay in such unlikely surroundings? Then, drawing closer, I saw at last the reason. The tall widow held by the hand a child who, like herself, was dressed in mourner's black. However modest the cost of a ticket, perhaps, it would pay for one of the child's needs, or even more for something extra, a toy. She will travel home on foot, dreaming and meditating alone, always alone, for a child is turbulent and selfish, without gentleness or patience, and cannot, even less than a simple animal, a dog or a cat, serve as the confidant of lonely sorrows. It's such a city poem, isn't it? It's something, it's a scene I think you would only see in, you know, a large town or a small or large city where there's a sort of mob of people who can just kind of get a glimpse of what the rich are doing in a distance, catch a scrap of the music that's being played, um, sort of crowding around whatever in closure or fence there might be. They're not like the baby deer that can't just leap over it. Um, and they're interested. And Baudelaire has um, what I might call a contemptible contempt for the masses, you know, the mob of outcasts, he calls them. You know, even in mob of outcasts, though, I find just the slightest hint of empathy there because he understands that they've been cast out from this world that they dream about, this world that um, is elsewhere. Um, the way that people will gather around to watch somebody famous, you know, stand in a crowd for hours or show up at Times Square among hundreds of thousands of others. And um, maybe the way people used to gather to watch uh, TV through store windows, because in the early days of television, very few people could afford TV, but they could sort of maybe afford to go watch something that was playing in a store window. Um, so it's that sense of things. But even within that, you know, he's calling them the empty headed crowd. So there's not a whole lot of empathy going on. And then he spots this one woman. And I just want to point out that the way this poetry is working, I don't know if you noticed this or thought about this, is kind of cinematic, really. You know, it starts out with the sort of overview, you know, your back. You see this crowd and even further away, you sort of see little glimpses of the wealthy and you keep kind of focusing in and focusing in until you see this one woman standing there dressed all in black and he's thinking, what on earth is she doing standing here listening to this kind of, um, you know, public concert and, you know, not buying a ticket and just listening to it and standing in this crowd. And he's bewildered by it. And then it's as if the camera comes in finally close enough so that you can see she's standing there holding her child's hand. And um, that there is no longer really the money maybe that there once was when uh, her husband was alive. And so rather than spending the money on a ticket for the music, she goes and stands with her child in the thought that, you know, with that little extra money, maybe she can buy a treat for the kid or better yet, a toy. And, um, and then I think his empathy both continues and disappears because he has no empathy for that little kid sort of saying that, you know, a child is, is less good company than a, than a dog would be or a cat. And yet, and I think you have to have been a parent to sort of understand this. You know, when you are a grown up and you're sad or troubled or bereaved and you have a very, very small child, the truth is they can't understand your sadness and you don't even want them to understand that sadness. You want them to continue to be children um, 
and to be able to live a kind of thoughtlessly happy life for a while. And you'll go anywhere with that, with that child. Um, you know, I was not widowed until my daughter was 10 and I was um, not made bankrupt because of that death, but I still understood the interest in going wherever I thought my daughter would be happy. And many times we would stand in crowds watching like acrobats or jugglers or um, dancers, you know, like break dancers, street dancers, street musicians, people who were trying to be funny, um, making toy balloons, lots of things that I would not normally want to be standing there watching because I was holding my daughter's hand and I wanted her to derive happiness from being in that crowd. And she used to love those street performances. So I think there's this deep understanding here. I don't know if maybe Charles Baudelaire experienced that in the very early days after his father died when he was still a little boy and perhaps his mother would take him out to some of these public places or if he was able to just make this kind of remarkable leap into a completely different um, point of view and kind of life than the one he would normally live or be thinking about. But that's, that's what I love about that poem. And, and now we're gonna move to the bad glazier. The glazier, by the way, is simply somebody who kind of um, makes glass windows or glass panes for houses uh, and then sells them. And um, I just want to point out to you that the narrator of this poem is kind of the ultimate unreliable narrator, right? Um, he wants us to see the world from his point of view, but it's almost impossible to do that. We keep sort of thinking, well, you know, I'm not sure about what you're doing here. It seems really mean and weird. Um, so not only is he unreliable, he's, you know, in fact, kind of a monster and possibly bipolar. So here we go. One morning I woke in a vicious temper, sad, tired of my own idleness and compelled, it seemed to me, to do something grand, perform some brilliant deed. To me, that really does sound a bit like mania. It was... Um, a couple of students last year who kind of pointed that out. I opened the window, alas. The first person that I saw below was a glassmaker whose piercing, discordant cry came up to me through the heavy, filthy air of Paris. I could never say why I was suddenly seized by an irrational loathing of this poor man. Hey, you, I shouted, motioning for him to come up. At the same time, I reflected, not without amusement, that since my room was on the sixth floor and the staircase extremely narrow, he was bound to find it hard to climb and might catch in many a place the corners of his merchandise. So this guy is really mean-spirited, right? Finally, he appeared. After examining all his glass carefully, I roared, what, you have no colored glass? No pink, no red, no blue, no magic windows, no panes of paradise. You impudent lout, how dare you walk about in the poor neighborhoods without a single glass to make life look more beautiful. And I shoved him toward the stairs where he stumbled and swore. Then I ran to my balcony and seized a small flower pot. And when the man reappeared in the entrance below, I let my engine of war fall on the edge of his wares. The shock knocked him over, and falling backward, he shattered all of his poor walking stock in trade with a noise like the crash of lightning striking a glass palace. And drunk with madness, I shouted furiously, make life beautiful, make life beautiful. 
is one crazy poem, isn't it? Really? Um, first of all, you might ask yourself, why? Why, why write a poetry without rhythm, without rhyme? Um, I'm trying to still make it have, what does he say, like the suppleness of poetry and to get the, the undulations of consciousness and the prickings of conscience. So here's a guy who knows that this day he did something really bad. I mean, he says it was an irrational loathing of this poor man. Um, you know, a glass maker and a glass vendor of all things. But if you look at the poem just a little more closely, you can see there's something else at work here too, as there was really in the other poem. Because if you write about cities, one of the things you're going to do, or hopefully you're going to do, is you're going to have to write about the poor because they are everywhere. And Angelica, I so agree with you. I think that crash of lightning striking a glass palace is the sort of beauty that is almost for its own sake. Not just almost, but truly for its own sake. It is very much a chaotic and beautiful phrase, isn't it? It's strangely like music. So this narrator kind of seduces us into his point of view. And his argument is, how do you dare to walk around the poor neighborhoods without anything to make life beautiful? You know, we talk about looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. And, you know, as a way of trying to look at the world through a lens of that beautifies the world the world that might otherwise look sordid and dirty and ugly all the time. And so what he's saying is this larger belief, right? That that beauty is a kind of a God really to these poets. And if you can make life beautiful, you have done a remarkable thing. And so his hatred for this poor glass maker is a kind of hatred on behalf of the poor who have nothing beautiful to look at, nothing to lift up their lives, nothing to beautify their lives. So you sort of hate and understand this narrator at the same time. And even the moment when he throws the flower pot um, from the sixth floor, I mean, the odds of it catching on the edge of the glass are so remote in the first place. It reminds me of like an old Laurel and Hardy movie in a way. It's vaudeville, isn't it? Throwing a flower pot. That's the kind of thing they used to do in these sort of old style comedy movies. You know, you'd throw a flower pot out the window and it would hit the, you know, the cops on the head and they're running around chasing each other and letting the bad guy get past them and things like that. So there's this element of uh, the ridiculous of vaudeville. And, and at the same time, there is that noise, like the crash of lightning striking a glass palace. That's the one moment when he creates the beauty that the glazier didn't have, right? Even the fact that he's talking about a glass palace, right? This is the palace for the poor is a palace that destroys things. And you're definitely going to see that uh, in Rambo as well. Just as you would see it when you watch The Doors, you know, it's about destroying what is and what is accepted and the sort of structures around us. So beyond that, it is also just an experience. Yeah. It is very aggressive. So I'm gonna move on to Rambo, okay? Bad boy of uh, of French poetry. 
but he really was a boy. I think he was, I think he was actually 15 when he first um, started writing poetry. And he stopped writing by the time he was, I don't know, like maybe 25, something like that. He did not um, write for very long at all. Can you think for my notes? I remember. He was a little bit younger. Um, was he? Let's see. Yeah, he was actually. He was maybe 20, 25 years younger than Baudelaire. Um, so he lived from 1854 to 1891. He only wrote from 1870 to 1875, so even a shorter period than I thought, like from the time he was 16, saying here, till he was you know, 21, or 15 to 20, depending on how you look at it. Um, so he was, Rimbo, was this kind of celebrated, but only in the bad sense of the word, right? The sense in which I guess you'd say Jim Morrison was celebrated. Although, you know, if you go to the famous uh, Paris cemetery, um, Père de la Chaise, uh, have any of you ever been there? It's in, I think, like the 20th or 21st around Dismont, so it's really kind of the outskirts of Paris. There is, I think, the most amazing graveyard in the world because it contains remains of Eloise and Abelard. I thought they were completely fictional. I didn't even realize that this medieval nun and monk who had this illicit love affair together really existed and they're buried there. So is Chopin, whose grave always holds flowers. Um, people, especially from the Polish community, always make sure there are fresh flowers for Chopin. Oscar Wilde is there. And for many years, uh, people would come and they would kiss the monument. There's a beautiful kind of image of him on top of the grave, um, a sculpture. And the tradition was that you would wear lipstick and you would kiss it and leave these lipstick imprints. And when I went there the first time, it was covered with these kind of, um, you know, lipstick kisses and... Um, Needless to say, at a certain point, they put, I don't know, some kind of plexiglass or something around the grave so that you can't actually kiss the stone anymore. Right now, that makes a lot of sense, obviously, during COVID, but I don't know. I think it'll let people kiss Oscar Wilde's grave. A lot of people leave notes there as well. I know I left a note for Oscar, um, but by far the most visited grave, actually, these days. Um, and for a long time has been Jim Morrison's. Um, anyway, after Rambo stopped being a poet, he became a gun runner and a coffee seller dealer in Ethiopia, as well as a slave trader. So not a nice guy. Again, you know, you're not looking at people who are necessarily admirable characters in any way. Um, when he was a teenager, he ran away from home. Uh, he had a very strict mother, um, who I think he feared and detested. And he ran away because he had sent a few poems to the French poet Verlaine. And Verlaine said, you know, you must come, we will welcome you in Paris. And uh, so he did. He ran to Verlaine, who was married, by the way, with children. And Verlaine fell in love with Rambo, left his wife and children, and became a very jealous lover. Uh, followed him to a railway station. They would sort of break up and come back together, break up and then come back together. And at one point, Verlaine actually shot Rambo. Um, luckily for Rambo, he was only shot in the wrist and was able to be treated. Um, and he had not planned, apparently, to report Verlaine for attacking him, but he was afraid because Verlaine was running around the city of um, Paris with a gun in his hand, 
who did actually report him and for Ling ended up spending um, many years in jail, in prison. So he managed to uh, wreck that life. Uh, it was, of all people, Rumbo, who started life as a devout Catholic and ended as a devout Catholic. That, to me, is just kind of incredible, really. Um, I was talking about how there's this kind of solipsistic interior reality. Um, and yes, Daisy absolutely rage that goes through these French poets. It's almost their life's blood in some ways. Um, and Rambeau wrote, I have wasted my life by being too sensitive. And I love this description. He was, um, Oh, what is that word? Where you um, confuse one sense for another. Synesthesia. He was synesthetic, I guess is what maybe you would call it. So that he could like smell sounds and um, hear sights. And he would remember things uh, in terms of other senses. So for instance, he had um, color associations with every letter of the alphabet. It's something that's not uncommon for people who have synesthesia. They might see numbers in terms of colors, but could be letters in terms of colors. So I um, think that also just that kind of physiological fact gives you a little bit of insight into where some of this kind of hallucinatory writing comes from. They also, of course, were taking hallucinogenics of their day, uh, you know, drinking absinthe, which would make you hallucinate, um, smoking opium, getting extraordinarily drunk and so on. This is what he wrote though about his, his sort of taste in things and what he was like. What I liked were absurd paintings, pictures over doorways, stage sets, carnival backdrops, billboards, bright colored prints, old fashioned literature, church Latin, erotic books full of misspellings, the kind of novels our grandmothers read, fairy tales, little children's books, old operas, silly old songs, the naive rhythms of country rhymes. I dreamed of crusades, voyages of discovery that nobody had heard of, republics without histories, religious wars stamped out, revolutions in morals, movements of races and continents. I used to believe in every kind of magic. I invented colors for the vowels, A black, E white, I red, O blue, U green. I made rules for the form and movement of every consonant, and I boasted of inventing with rhythms from within me, a kind of poetry that all the senses sooner or later would recognize. I turned silences and nights into words. What was unutterable, I wrote down. I made the whirling world stand still. That is a very different vision of poetry than the one we read in Mary Oliver's Rules for the Dance, right? There really are no rules for this dance. You make up the rules from within you and with all of your senses. So it is more like chaos for the dance. Right? But the dance is itself a kind of tarantella, you know, it's like a fever dance. Speaking of which, he wrote, I have stretched ropes from steeple to steeple garlands from window to window, golden chains from star to star, and I dance. I 
don't always see those moments of just beauty in Rambo. To me, you really see kind of rage and revolution. But now and then you do, you get these glimpses of, of beauty. He wrote, I believe in hell, therefore I am. That's quite different from, I think, therefore I am. But it is just really, when you think about it, an extrapolation of that same idea, right? If you find the reality of the world, the confirmation of existence inside yourself, if you believe you are in hell, you are. Um, and I'm sure he must be thinking of Milton's Satan who says, I myself am hell. So it's, I think it's really hard to read Rambo aloud. Um, in some ways, actually impossible. And, and I think it really is because how, how on earth do you capture the chaos of his writing um, and the howling of it? Maybe Allen Ginsberg's howl in some ways takes its um, starting step from people like the French symbolists. By the way, it won't surprise you to hear that um, poets like Jim Morrison loved Rimbaud. Um, he's there. He's their poet. So I'm just going to read you the last section, section five um, of the poem called Memory by Rimbaud. And remember, of course, you are listening to a translation, so there's a lot we're not getting. But definitely listen for all the colors, right? Um, and the sense of disorder and of revolution. Oh, wait a minute. Speaking of revolution, there is one quote I really need to read to you. It's probably the most famous thing in a way, the most quoted thing uh, Rambo wrote. And in a letter to a friend, he wrote, I say one must be a seer. Make oneself a seer by a long, full, and deliberate derangement of all the senses, all forms of love, suffering, and madness. He searches himself. He exhausts all poisons in himself and keeps only their quintessences. He becomes among all men the great patient, the great criminal, the one accursed, and the scholar because he reaches the unknown. Everything Rambo wrote was full of exclamation points, including what I'm going to be reading to you. I don't I'm gonna just hold it up so you can see it. If you didn't notice it when we were reading it, it's like nine million um, exclamation points, especially when you get to, get to the end. It's I'm looking at it literally. It's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yep, I probably missed one. And that's just in the second half of this section. All right. Take a deep breath, take some more of the tea. Welcome, Katie. More late in Lassie, but we're glad to have you. Very glad to have you. Okay. Plaything of this eye of mournful water, I cannot reach. Oh, boat without motion. Oh, two short arms. Either this flower or that one, neither the yellow one, which implores me here, nor the blue one the beloved in the ashes water. Ah, the pollen of willows which a wing shakes, 
the roses of the reeds long since eaten away, my boat still fast and its anchor chain taut to the bottom of this limitless eye of water. In what slime? What does it matter to us, my heart, the sheets of blood and of red hot coals and a thousand murders and long howls of rage, sobbings from every inferno, destroying every kind of order and still the north wind across the wreckage and all the vengeance, nothing. But yes, we still desire it. Industrialists, princes, senates, perish. Power, justice, history, down it is our due. Blood, blood, the golden flame, all to war, to vengeance, to terror. My soul, let us turn in the wound, ah, Away with you, republics of this world, of emperors, regiments, colonists, peoples, enough. Who should stir the vortices of furious flames but we and those whom we imagine brothers? It's our turn, romantic friends. We are going to enjoy it. Never shall we labor, O oh, fiery waves. Europe, Asia, America, vanish. Our march of vengeance has occupied every place, cities and countrysides. We shall be melted. The volcanoes will explode and the oceans stricken. Oh, my friends, my heart, it is certain they are brothers, dark strangers if we began. Come on, come on. Oh, evil fortune, I feel myself tremble. The old earth on me who am more and more yours. The earth melts. It is nothing. I am here. I am still here. So. I'm not gonna try to explain any of that. I think you're supposed to dive into it and so I'm just presenting it to you it's kind of a pool of fire so you know be careful when you dive into such places that you don't get burned um, and you don't get trapped but um, it's powerful poetry right um, yes kind of very much like hell. Um, I think that's why he wrote, I believe myself in hell, therefore I am. He had certainly an awareness that if you believe you're creating your own reality, then that's the reality you live in. And that's kind of a scary place, it's kind of a scary thing. Um, and certainly is calling for revolution of every kind, but I wouldn't call it a happy <laughs> revolution. You know, it's very French. And you remember how their revolution went. So in many ways, actually, this part of the poem reminds me of the French uh, national anthem, you know, which has lots of kind of blood and armies and glory in it. I'll have to find out when that was written, but to me, it's, it's, they sound similar, except this is kind of the Alice in Wonderland version of Sundown. Okay, so um, you guys know that I'm waiting for a mini submission from you. You can look under announcements or assignments and find a little um, place under assignments. It should be much, much easier for those of you who struggled to um, be able to give me your um, Google Docs. This is actually kind of a Google assignment place. And I've heard from several students in my other class 
um, thanking me for um, finding this way to uh, make your lives easier. I really don't deserve the thanks. I just was um, complaining on your behalf to my IT person and then she wrote to me in joy saying, hooray, you know, Google has created this new thing and you can create it under assignment. So, all right. Um, I'm excited for Thursday because Daisy is going to be talking to us and um, I'll be talking to you from New Jersey, which I've never tried to do before. Um, so we'll see. There may be babies and pugs involved. We shall see. It is way easier, Jason. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, yeah, Eden, I would love to see your first snow poem if you would like to put in there as an extra something. I would absolutely love it. I'm so glad you wrote one. I had just offered that as um, something I normally do with students. I, I always ask for a first snow poem when there's a first snow. It's not a requirement. It's just something you might like to write. Am I correct in, in saying it that way? I think I probably offered extra credit for doing it. Um, I think I heard there might be more snow coming, but I'm just not even going to allow myself to think about that. All right, guys, I want to let you out a few minutes early so that you can really, truly take even a few minutes to go outside in what may be the last kind of warm, golden day of 2020. I hope not. December sometimes surprises us in a good way. Um, so... Any other questions before I let you go? I think, Dom, you did actually say that earlier. Oh, and before I do let you go, um, can you please all just say goodbye to me now? Yes, you can also include your party that You can include that. Um, pretty much any time you want, if you want to email it to me or send it to me. So before you leave, say goodbye. Thank you. Enjoy your day too. Maria, you're welcome to be here. By anonymous penguin, also the one to So I have to see who actually stayed to the end of the class. So, bye Daisy. I'll see you on Thursday. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Remember, if you're still here, say goodbye to me so that I can give you credit for having stayed to the end. Did you guys see the um, the deer, by the way? Were you able to see the little baby deer jumping? Okay. Give you a couple minutes, so assume that who said goodbye was who was there. I'm just going to land off. I forgot to tell you guys when it was 11 11. I'm going to 
from the dear listener. It's such a little fella. Bye, Paul. Bye, Paul.